Good afternoon, everyone. Firstly, thank you very much for joining today. My independent project looked at whether machine learning algorithms can be used accurately to characterize reservoirs in deep water systems while using the Angel Formation Australia as an example. In this presentation, I will go over these following aspects, which includes a geological context, a comparison of this work to similar works in order to help justify aims and methodology. I'll briefly talk about the data set and features before moving on to the main body of the presentation, which consisted of three key parts, the sedimentology, the petrophysics, and of course, the exciting bit, how all this ties in with the machine learning. The numerous sets of results will then be discussed. And finally, I'll outline a few key concluding remarks and my personal view of the application of machine learning in both industry and education. The Angel Formation exists as an Upper Jurassic multiple feeder coalesced deep marine fan sequence with several channel and lobe sub-environments. It occupies the stratigraphic lows of the rift-related Dampier subbasin of the Northwest Shelf. The Angel Formation and other such deep water systems may act as economically important reservoirs, but they can be high risk in terms of their reservoir fasces quality and reservoir architecture. Therefore, a cost-effective way of mitigating these risks is key in exploration and production. This is where machine learning can be very beneficial. Before delving into the application of machine learning in this project, it's important to consider that although it's a relatively unutilized tool in geoscience, it is gaining traction, which helps to justify the usefulness of this project. Papers such as Prelat et al 2015 employ similar methodologies and comparable aims in their use of machine learning and neural networks. They help to validate that classifiers can be used in geoscience accurately, Lee 2003 and Lim 1997 also illustrate the usefulness of machine learning in industry as a cost effective alternative to current techniques. This project utilised 10 cores which totaled 385 metres. Once properly formatted and conditioned, there was a data point for every 10 centimetres of depth, meaning that it was at maximum just under 4,000 data points to be input into the machine learning algorithms. As to the petrophysical data, there were four sets of gamma ray, neutron, density, sonic velocity and resistivity. The diagram on the right is an example of what will feature prominently throughout the presentation, but in short it consists of each wireline track, as well as a fasces interpretation column, the prediction of the interpretation based on the petrophysics, a probability column and a sedimentary log from where the interpretations were made. The first key stage of this study was to manually interpret the angel formation fasces from associated sedimentary logs. This is important as the fasces interpretations act as a means for the algorithms to test their learning and predictions against in order to determine accuracies. There were five distinct fasces interpreted, which include A. Biodebated heterolithics, B. Unstructured sands, C. Dewatered sands, D. Debrites, and E. Injection sands and silts. The heterolithics are siltstones characterised by heavy biodipations and interpreted as part of a low density turbidity current. The unstructured sands are larger homogeneous sandy bed sets interpreted as high density turbidity currents. The dewatered sands are defined by dark concave upward laminae which are interpreted as dish and pipe structures formed from rapid deposition causing dewatering. The debrites consist of sand with small fine class of mud and finally, the injection sands and silts are defined by regular intervals of heterolithic muds and sands. Both core images and digitised logs of each fasces are shown here. In terms of sedimentary fasces distribution across all training wells, fasces B, the unstructured sands, are clearly dominant, as they are interpreted as forming the main lobe environments of the deep water formation. As you can see here, it accounts for 72.7% of the fasces interpreted. This can be further illustrated by the breakdown between all 10 wells, which shows a common trend of a dominant fasces B. However, wells Angel 4, Egret 2 and Renee 3 shown here have a slightly more varied distribution with Angel 4 dominant in fasces B, Egret 2 dominant in fasces A, on A3 having the most even distribution overall relative to the other wells. And also this reasoning 
these wells were chosen as the first three training wells for the three well scenario. The machine learning in this study uses petrophysical data to build a prediction model for the interpreted wells. Because of this, there needs to exist quantitative justification for using machine learning to assign fasces rather than a manual interpretation. Here are several histograms which represent each petrophysical data type for each fasces. And although certain petrophysical features between these fasces are distinguishable from each other, there are overlaps. For example, the gamma ray between fasces B and fasces C. These overlaps help to justify, from a petrophysical point of view, the application of machine learning in discriminating between fasces beyond the capabilities of a manual interpretation. The machine learning algorithms can better identify the minute differences between fasces petrophysical signatures and apply that training to the models. Before I begin to tie machine learning and sedimentology and petrophysics together, it is necessary to discuss what machine learning is exactly. With machine learning, the resulting output will only ever be as good as the quality of the input data, so making sure it is correctly conditioned and formatted is essential. But once you're happy with the input data, you can upload it and allow the algorithms to train on it. Once trained, they will test against themselves to assess their accuracy. This is where any adjustments or fine tuning can be fleshed out. For example, there was a slight offset in the depth between the logs and the core in my project, which required some adjustment. After that, and if everything looks good, we can move on to retraining and then applying the trained algorithms to untrained independent wells. In this case, COSAC 1, Lambert 2 and Lambert 9, in order to produce prediction models. The models will compare the prediction to the interpretation which gives an optimized classification accuracy as a percentage. In this study, I used two types of supervised machine learning, classification and regression. Supervised machine learning allows the user to train a data set to predict and label discrete classes, which is what classification is, but also to predict a continuous variable, which is what regression is. These diagrams here are just to help illustrate both these points. The classifiers used to produce the prediction models were random forest, scalar vector, neural network, and XGBoost, while the regressors for continuous variable prediction were random forest, Gaussian process regressor, XGB regressor, and high gradient boosting regressor. Now we have a grasp of the sedimentology, petrophysics, and the concept of machine learning, we can move on to the results. The first set of models were produced using a three well training data set where Angel 4, Egret 2, Renee 3 were trained and applied to COSAC 1, Lambert 2 and Lambert 9. The highest accuracy achieved with this scenario was 75.6%. This was done using scalar vector and COSAC 1 and could be seen by the prediction model here. The prediction column shows there was a good prediction for heterolithics and unstructured sands, but struggled with some of the finer beds of fasces and mispredicted part of the first 10 meters of core. However, overall prediction was good for an initial scenario and there was very little confusion as shown by the matrices here. The scalar vector classifier produced the most accurate results across all wells and the total average was 52%, which is a fair standard. In order to increase the optimised classification accuracy of the prediction models, more wells and therefore more data points were added to the input. However, one ideal well, X to 5, was missing a DT curve, which is essential for the training and prediction. Despite this, X to 5 was added by producing a synthetic sonic velocity log using machine learning regressors. This was a multi-step process, and it started with a Pearson correlation plot to assess whether a synthetic log was indeed possible. By plotting the other petrophysical parameters relative to DT in this way and seeing strong positive or negative correlations, i.e. close to one or negative one, it shows it's possible. The next step was to train the algorithm using the three initial wells and then plot predicted DT against actual DT. A strong positive correlation like this one shows that it's not only possible to produce a synthetic DT, but it's possible to do it accurately. I then compared the train and test for Renee 3, the 
the grey line being the actual DT and the red being the predicted, to visually assess if it was accurate and matched the upwards of 90% accuracy for the optimised regressions. Finally, it was possible to display the DT of X to 5, the fourth column being entirely synthetic, as shown here. I was then ready to add the well to the new input. As I said before, one way to increase the accuracy of the prediction models was to increase the number of data points. By adding more wells such as X to 5 and then rerunning the training of the algorithms, it was possible to produce another set of models from the three independent untrained wells. As you can see here, by adding more wells and increasing the number of data points for the classifiers to train from, there was a 6% increase in optimised classification accuracy for the scalar vector classifier predicting on COSAC1 between the three well and the now 10 well scenario. This was the overall pattern across the other wells and classifiers for adding more data points, with the average accuracy being 64.5%, which is a 12.5% increase compared to three wells. Another way to improve the accuracy of the results was by adding the first and second derivatives to both the three well and 10 well input. By adding these derivatives, it essentially tripled the number of trainable data points. For example, just under 4,000 data points for 10 wells increased to just under 12,000. The result of this was a marked improvement in accuracies across certain wells and certain classifiers. The model on the right is an example from the 10 well data set and again COSAC1 using scalar vector, which saw an other classification accuracy increase to 89.5%, the highest achieved throughout the study. But also Lambert9 using random forest saw a large increase in accuracies from 49.4% without derivatives to 70.5% with derivatives, thus proving that this method can greatly improve prediction accuracy. The final set of results produced for this project were an attempt to reduce any confusion between the sandy fasces, the unstructured sands and the dewatered sands, but to also add another petroleum aspect into this project. This was done by grouping the sands into one fasces and then splitting them based on their wettability, which was determined via resistivity cutoff. By producing a histogram of the resistivity from all the training wells and applying a 30 ohm cutoff for what is water wet and gas wet, the logs were reinterpreted to remove the original fasces and then add gas wet sounds and water wet sounds in their place. However, the prediction models for this scenario were all very low, with an accuracy here of 39.4%. The confusion between sounds was also not resolved as seen by the matrix. The issue with this particular methodology is likely due to the fact that, although a cutoff based on resistivity was produced, the training was also done using the other petrophysical parameters, some of which are not impacted by varying fluid types but rather used for helping determine the capability of a rock storing fluids within its pore space. The main points to take away from this work is that supervised machine learning can be used to create predictive models for sedimentary fasces from log data and untrained wells. But increasing the number of data points for the classifiers to train from increased the optimized classification accuracy. The use of first and second derivatives produced the most accurate results, particularly regarding the use of 10 wells. The gas wet water wet self fasces prediction on COSAC1 produced poor prediction results. But I believe the methodology presented here can be readily applied to any deep water clastic system globally, or any other reservoir type for that matter. This type of research and methodology has a place in hydrocarbon exploration and production. Prediction of fasces in the sedimentary well log using well log data can help to constrain the reservoir architecture, define levels of compartmentalization, identify reservoir zones of interest, and proved to be more cost effective than extracting core. There is also a table showing the full set results, with green showing 65% or above accuracy, yellow 50 to 64.9% and red below 50% accuracy. And finally, I think it's an important point to conclude with that not only does this kind of research and methodology have a place in industry, but it should be included in some form in undergraduate and postgraduate education. The more students getting interested and involved with this work early on in their careers will mean greater improvements will come sooner to the industry regarding machine learning uses and techniques. 
That concludes my presentation for my independent project. Thank you all very much for listening. And if anyone has any questions, please ask away. Thank you.